CTV News at 5 with Hudson Mack. Police are issuing a Canada-wide warrant tonight for a Ladysmith man after he escaped from a halfway house in Victoria. And officers are warning you tonight that he may be in the capital region and he is considered to be dangerous. The man is 50-year-old Guy Jean Tomov, who failed to return to his Victoria halfway house in late January. He's described as a First Nations man, six feet tall, about 215 pounds. Police say he has a history of violence. Avoid confronting him if you can. Tomov was in the middle of serving time for his third federal sentence for robbery when he disappeared. He's also serving time for impaired driving and failing to attend court. Anyone who has information on the whereabouts of Guy Tomov is asked to contact their nearest police or Crime Stoppers. Well, North Saanich could soon find itself in the home stretch, holding the key to nearly 34 hectares of prime land if council decides to go ahead with a land swap. The owner of Sandown Racetrack has asked the District of North Saanich to allow nearly five hectares to be rezoned for commercial use, and in exchange, he will gift 34 acres to the district to be added to the agricultural land reserve. Last night, with a packed house, council voted in favor of working up a draft memorandum with the agricultural land reserve. The district is hoping to have public hearings on the swap sometime by this summer or early fall. A Vancouver Island bank is making a big pledge to help cancer patients in the capital region, reaching deep into its vault. CIBC handed over a check for $125,000 today to the Victoria Hospitals Foundation and its Building Care Together campaign. The money will go towards oncology care at the new patient care center at Royal Jubilee Hospital, located on the eighth floor of the patient care center. The plan is to buy state-of-the-art equipment for cancer care and to create a welcoming environment for families who will be staying the night. Campaign organizers say the CIBC donation marks a major milestone. It's taking us to the halfway mark of our goal of 25 million, and it's it's fabulous that it, it provides and shows community support. Um, CIBC is, is one bank that has stepped forward consistently. You know, we have 140,000 uh, customers in South Vancouver Island, and I, I think it's important both for our customers and our, and our employees that uh, that we give to the community, not only through uh, financial, but also uh, through our employee involvement in causes, so volunteerism. The Victoria Hospitals Foundation has raised more than $80 million to benefit hospitals and patient care in the capital region since 1989. The Victoria parents of a dead Canadian soldier are hoping they will get the answer they have been seeking for the past four years with a public hearing into their son's suicide. A public inquiry into the death of Corporal Stuart Langridge got underway in Ottawa today. Langridge hanged himself in the barracks at CFB Edmonton where he was stationed in March 2008. The 29-year-old had served on tours in Bosnia and Afghanistan and was suffering from post-traumatic stress and struggling with substance abuse. After his death, his family learned that he had tried to kill himself on six previous occasions, and his parents wonder why that information was withheld from them, and they hope the public hearing will help answer their many questions. It's a search for the truth, very definitely. And uh, we would just like to see a really open, transparent investigation into how our son died and why. Um, and there are, there are civilian oversight bodies, so we think that this is going to be a really good thing. And uh, I think that there were, some, there were some steps along the way that could have been done differently. And if we can save the life of even one soldier by coming forward, um, you know, changes will be made, I think. The hearing is expected to take two and a half months. The family is being represented by a retired colonel. The CTV News investigation on the Lower Mainland has uncovered evidence of serious deceptive practices in the British Columbia pet cremation industry. And if you're a pet owner, you're not going to like the story. A shocking hidden camera investigation has uncovered disturbing evidence of unethical behavior. Evidence that the majority of pet cremation businesses in BC may be taking advantage of their grieving customers in the name of profit. We warn you that some viewers may find some of the pictures in this report disturbing. Rebecca Breeder is a cat lover, a uh, breeder rather, with a soft spot in her heart for an elderly tabby named Leonard. So when Leonard died, Rebecca opted to have him privately cremated. That means her cat alone would be placed in the crematorium. Its remains returned in a special urn. Rebecca paid $150 for a private cremation. When we got the, our ashes back, we, we didn't even question it. We didn't even assume that it wasn't Leonard. 
Rebecca was horrified to learn that her beloved tabby was likely placed in what is called a communal burn, a much cheaper process that cremates many animals at once. Pet owners like Rebecca are then unknowingly given back urns full of generic animal bone. Rebecca's suspicions grew after learning the crematorium that handled her cat and several other crematoriums in B.C., including some on Vancouver Island, had failed an undercover test of their procedures. The investigation was paid for by an alliance of businesses in the pet industry and was conducted by several retired RCMP members. Our undercover operator would uh, use an, a covert camera, walk into a clinic and simply ask the staff person for a private cremation of a, of a pet. But instead of using a real animal, the private eyes purchased stuffed robotic toy cats, took the components out, and simply restuffed them with five pounds of hamburger meat. The toy cats were then frozen and taken to several vet offices to be transported for private cremations. Within days, the urns were ready for pickup and the contents analyzed by UVic senior archaeologist Becky Wigan. This is bone that's been uh, burnt so much it's ended up sort of stuck together in clumps. But these pieces are very definitely bone. You know, as an investigator, says, you know, there's, first, there's a fraud going on, and secondly, what an easy way to do something diabolical. Resources with the place are limited in terms of fraud investigations, and, um, you know, one of the answers we got back was they got bigger fish to fry. Two crematoriums caught the toy cats. Three passed the test, returning the remains of the toy cats, essentially a few screws and a pinch of dust. But six other crematoriums on the Lower Mainland and on Vancouver Island failed, returning urns that were filled with animal bone. The private investigation was paid for by a group of animal lovers and industry experts who suspected unethical behavior on the part of some companies who were severely undercutting the competition in B.C. It was exposed by Steel on Your Side at CTV. This group calls itself the Pet Cremation Alliance, and they have just launched a comprehensive website and social media campaign to educate pet owners about the industry. CTV News, Vancouver Island Report. A young woman in Nanaimo was assaulted earlier this morning on Highland Boulevard, punched in the face and then robbed. Happened about 3.15 this morning. The woman was walking down the street on her way to an early shift at work. She was approached by a man who punched her and demanded her valuables. She gave him some items and last saw him running down the island highway. She declined treatment. Um, she's obviously shaken up by what happened. It's a very traumatizing thing to be walking to work and have somebody just approach you and punch you. So, you know, it was very difficult for her. But, you know, she immediately went and contacted the police as soon as she arrived at work. The man is described as First Nations, about five foot three, with a pockmarked face in his early 20s, wearing a black sweater and track pants. If you know anything about this assault, you are asked to contact the Nanaimo RCMP. Well, we're just days away from learning the future of the e and rail service, the passenger service on Vancouver Island. It has been idle for the past year, awaiting $15 million in track upgrades. The province will pay for half of that, but the Island Corridor Foundation has been waiting on word from the federal government for the other half. It is expected to come on Thursday in the federal budget. We're not actually expecting that will be a line entry in the budget, but that will be in, embodied, hopefully, in a program that the, uh, the federal government will be bringing forward. Um, but we don't have any assurance that that's the fact. So there's a little bit of anticipation here. The Island Corridor Foundation says Vancouver Island North MP John Duncan has been working hard to lobby for federal money and things are looking positive. But opposition MP Jean Crowder of the NDP, who represents Nanaimo Cowichan, believes the opposite. She has says she's been told that there is no new money for infrastructure in the budget and she fears that that means it's going to be the end of the line for the E&M.